Today I'm talking to Ashok Mohanraj. He is an environmental analyst for the RCMP, winner of Starfish Canada's top 25 environmentalist under 25, and the best-selling author of the children's book, Pollinator Man. I read your book and I loved it. It's aimed at getting more kids to help the planet. You also want to help boys become more engaged in defending biodiversity. It's true when I go to conferences, there are a lot fewer guy activists. The kids I know, like Cash, Neve, Jack, George, Kiki, Prue, and Choing, are all doing such amazing things. We need more boys like them to take action. What made you realize that? Yeah, great question, Robin. Thanks for buying the book and supporting the journey of Pollinator Man. I noticed as my journey through environmental advocacy started, for context, I think I started this journey back in 2016, so probably seven years ago, so early in my undergraduate degree. And so even when I was growing up as a young boy, usually when you're in situations in academic institutions, they always ask young boys if they want to be in the most common answer. You might see this too in your own schools. Most guys will say astronauts, lawyers, doctors, very traditional, professional, high-paying jobs that are very prestigious. And it was never emphasized that a career in environmentalism or conservation was an option to young boys. And when I was um, in university, my program wasn't exactly environmental science, it was environmental studies. And the difference between those two is that environmental studies focuses more on the social elements of environmentalism. And so you'll notice that in spaces like those, you'll find a a lack of men, because men tend to lean towards more technical focused fields and science based fields. And so they don't really focus on social elements and human rights and stuff like that, especially when it's related to environmentalism. And so I noticed that in, in my program, at least I was one of only a handful of guys in my program. And it's not to, that you know, you know men need to take up space. It's more so that how do we bring more men to the table? Because in order to solve the climate crisis, as you probably know, is that we need we need lots of people, we need a lot of different perspectives. And so my goal is to kind of get more uh, young men specifically like you to the table in order to get your perspective and kind of encourage you to realize that conservation is meant for everyone. Yeah. Can you tell me what inspired you to write Pollinator Man? Growing up as a kid when I was your age, I used to love superheroes. I was a big fan of Stan Lee, uh, Marvel, Spider-Man, Batman, all those guys. I used to go to Fan Expo as a kid, you know, dressed up and all that good stuff. Uh, And I remember early on before all the Avengers movies and stuff came out a couple years ago, superheroes weren't as cool as they are now. You know, when you were a kid, you'd get picked on for wearing Spider-Man t-shirts. Now it's kind of cool and it's embraced. And the movie industry has, you know, dominated that superhero space. And it's kind of really cool to be be keeping up with with the superhero space. But I think for me, that's something that I've always loved as a kid. And that's something I was kind of wanted to be a part of and create. But the whole pollinator aspect of it is because uh, before uh, writing the book, I used to work for a real estate developer. Uh, and one of my jobs was to create a native landscaping strategy to support uh, new builds. So for example, when a real estate developer in Toronto builds a new condo, they have to destroy a bunch of pollinator habitat, whether it's the green belt or, or somewhere else where there is green space and that space or habitat is displaced. And so the idea was to figure out how could we support pollinators through these man-made structures. And then from there, I ended up consulting with a lot of bee experts, the specifically the ones from uh, York University. And then the pandemic hit and I had a lot of time on my hands and, and I was looking for something that I enjoyed and kind of just kind of passed by the time. And back in the day in high school, I used to work as a camp counselor. And that's something I really enjoyed growing up. And so I wanted to kind of get back in that space and kind of work with kids again. And so I'm like, what's a fun way to mix pollinators, superheroes and children's education all into one. And so I just decided to start writing the manuscript one day. And then from there it was kind of born. But again, going back to that main theme. One of the reasons why I made it Pollinator Man and person of color is because throughout my journey, I've always noticed a lack of representation or people who look like me. And also solving the issue of why men aren't engaged in the space. How do we make caring cool? It was my mission. How do we kind of get more men into the space by showing them that caring isn't a feminine trait or it's not exclusive to women. It's kind of caring, in fact, actually makes you more masculine. That's kind of how I see it. I like how he can talk to other animals and how he can pollinate. I didn't even know that lemurs were pollinators. Why is pollination the best superpower? It's what we need to get all of our food and oxygen that we need to survive. I think the stat is 33% of all the food that you consume is created by pollinators. One of every three bites, whether that's a fruit or a vegetable, comes from pollinators. And they're essential for us to enjoy all the foods that we include. And, you know, when I go out to schools, it's hard for people to contextualize that. But if you just think of your favorite favorite fruit or your favorite vegetable or even chocolate, chocolate isn't possible without pollinators. It's, it's what we need to survive, but it's also stuff that we enjoy in life. That's why I think pollination is the most important superpower. And so cacao pods need pollinate? Yeah, exactly. Oh, cool. 
I didn't know that. What do you do as an environmental analyst? Yeah, so as an environmental analyst for the RSMP, which is my day job, uh, a lot of it has to do with um, environmental compliance and environmental regulations. So because the RCMP is a federal department, they have to abide by uh, federal laws and regulations. And so my job is to help project managers or asset managers at the RCMP navigate those rules and regulations and kind of understand what laws apply to them and how they can make sure that they're in compliance. So for example, if the RCMP is building a new detachment, we have to go through processes like impact assessment, potable water testing, soil testing, indoor air quality testing, that just to make sure that the RCMP is in compliance with all the environmental federal laws that are applicable. You are going to law school soon. I've talked to Environmental Defense and Paul Pausland, who are both trying to protect the planet through law. Will you be doing environmental law? My plan has always been to do environmental law, and I'm still you know, early in that journey, and I'm still learning a lot two elements of environmental law that I want to focus on. Um, one is um, supporting climate refugees. So as you might know, Robert, climate change causes rising sea levels. And so that displaces a lot of people. And so a lot of people are going to have to move to new areas. And so one thing that I want to focus on is supporting those people uh, who are being displaced as a result of climate change. And then something else that I'm passionate about is polar law. And so that's anything related to the poles, so the Arctic and Antarctica, because uh, I used to do some research up there for a couple of months in the Arctic and on water governance. And so well, my passion is to learn more about the specific laws and regulations that govern polar resources and, and polar militarization and stuff like that. Cool. The destroyer has been busy in Canada lately with all the forest fires. Do you have hope we can defeat him? Yeah, yeah, the destroyer is is doing his job, and it's pretty daunting. Even you know here in, in front on the GTA, uh, you can see the smoke, and it's you know it's funny. I actually uh, woke up the other day, and I and I asked my dad, "Do you smell smoke? Do you smell something burning?" And I walked outside, and you can kind of see the smoke and the smog. So it's the first I've ever experienced this kind of air quality issue. But I think it's really extreme. It's pretty bad out there. It's one of the worst I've seen. And you're praying for all the families and the, and the communities that are affected and hopefully uh, they recover soon. But it's also the silver lining of all this is that now people start to realize that this is no joke. It's not It's not just about the environment. But it's about our human health. It's about how we can enjoy our surroundings. It's about recreation. And so from that sense, people are starting to wake up and be like, you know what? If this is going to be a common occurrence, maybe we need to change our ways. Maybe we need to be more proactive in protecting our planet. Because again, for most people right now, it's not about forests are burning. It's about I can't go outside and I can't breathe clean air. I can't go to the cottage and enjoy it. And that might sound superficial, or but I think if you can appeal to different reasons of why people would care about the environment, it's still a win, right? And I think people are starting to realize that that air quality is an important issue that's going to be affected as a result of climate change. And so I am hopeful that the destroyer will be defeated through community building and teamwork and awareness but we still have a long way to go yeah if you could say anything to boys out there who want to do more to fight climate change from biodiversity loss but don't know where to start what would you say i think when you don't know where to start i think starting anywhere is a great step right so when i was young i think the important thing is just to say yes to everything especially at your age when you're young uh, you don't know what you don't know until you try it and so the only way to get exposed to these things is try it out if you're interested in wildlife ecology go outside go on a bird watching tour or something like that and then you might like it you might hate it and you figure out maybe you want to go into clean tech maybe you want to go into solar panels maybe you buy a solar panel from your local hardware store tinker around with it and kind of see if that's something you like too i think just trying a bunch of different things talking to people i think for your generation a big one too is just the power of, of social media i think there are a lot of things you can see online that will kind of educate you and teach you and so we kind of take advantage of that I think also just don't be afraid of what other people are thinking. Again, going back to the theme that environmentalism or conservation isn't a traditional male role or male profession. I think now more and more people are realizing that this is so interconnected. It's not just about the environment. It's about the economy. It's about tech. It's about the cars we drive. There's lots of opportunities for people to get involved, especially at a young age. This has been a really great talk. Thanks so much for taking the time to chat with me today. Click the link below to buy a copy of Paul and the Airman. And remember, together kids can save the world. Please like and subscribe. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Robert. Keep up the great work.